Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Rolling Conversations um, for the third week. So thanks for everyone's support for watching the show so far and meeting some terrific people. And um, we're thrilled today to have um, a superstar of wheelchair tennis, uh, a member of the Australian Sporting Hall of Fame, the Australian Tennis uh, Hall of Fame, uh, a four-time Paralympian and um, world champion, uh, all the way from Budgie Boy as a young boy, which we're interested to hear more about. Um, David Hall, welcome to Rolling Conversations. Mick, you could, you could say superstar a few more times. I'd be cool with that. You're comfortable with that? <laughs> yeah, no, thanks, mate. No, it's great to be here. And uh, I think it's great what you guys have done with these uh, conversations. Good stuff. Yeah, I'm really pleased about that. And we've had a terrific response so far. People really looking to hear from people like yourself, you know, catch up and hear what you've been doing. And 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 for a lot of the older members of our community, and I say that respectfully, I mean that people that have been in the community for a long time will know your story. But many of us um, who are new to the community of wheelchair sports won't know the story. So I think tonight really serves as, as an education piece for a lot of us to hear the story of the man we've heard so much about. I've been with the organisation now since January of last year, and I must say, I've been looking forward to the opportunity to chat to you. Great. Sounds good. Let's let's go. Let's get into it. So I mentioned Budgie Boy at the start. For those that don't know, that's on the central coast of New South Wales. Um, what was life like for you growing up as a young man? I think you're 50 this year. So um, back in the, uh, in the 70s, what was life like in Budgie Boy? What, what do they say? 50 is the new 30? I, I think I've heard that a couple of times. Do they? Uh, okay. Look, growing up in Budgiewoy was fantastic. It was kind of ironic that I grew up in a beach town uh, because I'm I'm not a big water fan. Uh, I think I took swimming lessons when I was a kid, and I actually think the uh, the swimming instructor arrived at work uh, on a broom. So, uh, but I would get on the bus uh, coming from. Uh, Budgeway Primary School and the bus would take me uh, home and all the kids on the bus were just talking about the wind direction and they were all I were interested in is, gonna, is it going to be a good surf day uh, that afternoon but all I wanted to do was just get in the backyard, play cricket, um, go down to Budgeway Tennis Courts and, and hit some balls with Brownie, uh, my childhood mate. Uh, or just go to the soccer field and kick the soccer ball around. So, so it was kind of uh, it was a laid back, relaxing, sporty upbringing, and I think it was great to do that in such an environment that was was uh, kind of small because everyone knew everyone and and we could all kind of connect and and after school and. Uh, so that was, you know, that was really cool. And to be honest, I was never that academic. Um, so sport for me was pretty important and it was something that I loved doing. And I think when the school, school bell rang in the afternoon, I was like, oh, what could we do this afternoon to, to kind of get our uh, sport fix in? Yeah, cool. And did that love of sport come from your parents or uh, you mentioned when we were chatting earlier you had a younger sister? Where did that love of sport come from, do you think? Yeah, I don't know. I know mum mum and dad were into golf. Uh, so And mum was a big uh, rugby league fan, albeit she supported South. Um, I'm a Manly fan, by the way, uh, which may, Awkward. I don't know if people might like or hate that, probably more hate, but that's cool. We might so, edit that out, but that's okay. Go on. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I think it, it might have just come from within, I think. Like dad dad was not sporty except for the golf, uh, but I just knew that I was, I guess I was kind of a physical kid. Yeah. When you've got uh, your friends and they all want to kind of, go hit tennis balls or go play cricket or whatever it was, then you kind of want to be a part of that. And I know mum signed me up uh, when I was a kid. Uh, I think I was six years old. She signed me up for soccer. 
And so we'd play down at Budgie Boys Soccer Field and when, uh, like the folks out there will know that when you sign up a six-year-old for soccer, it's like you want to score, but it doesn't matter if you score for your team, you want to also score for the other team. So it's like the Keystone Cops following the ball around on the field and mum would say the folks, all the parents are on the sideline uh, laughing hysterically that we were scoring goals for the other team and would celebrate like it was, oh, we scored a goal. We didn't really care, you know, who for. Uh, so I was just having fun. And so I, I think nice. that was my, I guess, yeah, six playing soccer would have been my very first uh, kind of sporting uh, structural, I guess, with a team uh, experience. Yeah, cool. Now, we had a um, uh, Karen McBrien said hello to Hawley there, um, and you mentioned Brownie. Uh, obviously, it's the Australian way to have plenty of nicknames. Is there any other nicknames you've ever gone by or anything we need to know? No, David Hall, Hawley, uh, not exactly original, uh, sure. but I almost want to say Brownie gave me that nickname because uh, Paul Brown, I think I just started calling him Brownie, uh, and I guess that's what you do. You put a like a Y or an IE, you know, on the back of someone's surname and it becomes Smithy, Brownie, Pagey, Heidi, Hawley, you know, whatever it is. Um, I wish I could tell you that I had like an exotic nickname or something quirky, but uh, Hawley was it. We don't need to overcomplicate it. I agree. Now, um, so you started, you, you were a sporty young man, uh, and then um, after your accident, you discovered wheelchair tennis. And, of course, that you went on to be, I'll say the word again, a superstar of wheelchair tennis. Um, in what we've read about you, though, this, the, um, the first time you saw wheelchair tennis was with a fellow called Terry Mason playing. Is that right? Is that the true part of the story where you saw Terry for the first time playing the sport? Yeah, I was reading uh, the local newspaper. It was called The Advocate uh, at home with mum. And I was like, I can't believe that there's an article about a guy in a wheelchair playing tennis. Because I I really had no idea that, uh, you know, wheelchair sport or dis dis disability sport was an option. And then I thought, because I'd played tennis as a kid and you know, knew the grips and the swings and played local tournaments, uh, that I should find out, like, what's this wheelchair tennis about? And so I called Terry and then he suggested that we meet up and hit some balls. Uh, so we did. And I told him my story of playing tennis as a kid and, um, and he was excited. And I thought Terry looked like Fabio from the right. romance novels. He kind of had sure. that, that George Hamilton suntan and the muscles on his muscles and the sun-kissed hair. And he was so sporty. But I think from my perspective, he, he was just really uh, welcoming and laid back. And I think that was really important because I think for a lot, a lot of young athletes out there that they're trying a sport for the first time that like when the people are there that you're playing it with, that they're, they're very welcoming and uh, accepting. And I think that's fantastic. And I remember hitting balls with Terry and I hit the back fence more than I can remember. But uh, it was just something about the, like hitting the ball again. And it kind of took me back to when I was a kid and, and playing tennis with Brownie and uh, and I, I, I knew something was there. Like I was pretty much hooked straight away. And so right. I continued to hit with Terry and, and pretty much took it from there. Yeah, cool. And, and, and you hit on something really important we hear over and over again within our community, particularly for those who acquire their disability, that what a, what a, what a powerful force sport is in rehabilitation and also just feeling hopeful again, feeling optimistic that things can get better, that life can, you know, have some joy in it again. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, I think it's really important. And I think everyone goes on a journey and their journey is different. The timeline is different. And I think like some people can be more accepting at different periods of their recovery. 
And I think for me, because I'd had the accident, uh, it was a year and a half earlier at 16, that I I kind of had that that time frame to uh, recover and kind of go through it. It's almost like you're going through a fog and over time the fog clears and, and, and you reach a point where you're willing to try something. And I think that was the, the thing for me was that, I saw the article, I was willing to, because it's, it's a bit of a leap, and mm. I, just, I knew I, I kind of had to make that leap. And so after I made the leap, that was when, you know, things kind of become uh, a bit easier, a bit more clear, and then you kind of discover, like I did, that I'm on a path, and I just needed to keep going down that path. I mean, I had no idea where it was going to go. I had no idea that I would become number one or even get on the tour and play tournaments for a living. Uh, but in the beginning, it was the, the spark. That's, that was the big thing for me. I knew the spark was there, so I just had to, to kind of let it, uh, let it burn. Isn't that cool? And, and what a great reminder it is for us as the organisation now that we're the guardians of this wheelchair sports New South Wales idea that's been around since 1961. But... You know, what an important role Terry Mason played in your development um, and the fact that he was welcoming and he wrapped an arm around you early and said, come on in and, and responded to you. And it's just a great reminder how important that first point of contact is when someone reaches out and says, I want to have a go. Yeah, exactly right. And I think guys like Terry Mason, Errol Hyde, those guys are the heart and soul of wheelchair sports and and I think every individual sport needs those kind of guys because like not only are they very supportive but they're also uh, the social glue that kind of brings everyone together and I think that's that's really important as well because for me it just wasn't about the sport in the beginning it was also you know the social aspect of it that I was oh man there's other people in chairs and oh man they're kind of cool and they all have different personalities and it's just a you know, reflection of uh, society in general. Yeah. Now, uh, fast forward from that point, um, you're in, you're playing wheelchair tennis, you're on your way. And in 1989, um, you play your first Australian Open. Do you remember what that was about? You know, you're, you're playing in the national tournament for the first time. Yeah, I do remember that. They, it was funny, they put me in a lower division because they didn't want to feed me to the wolves. Uh, in main draw, which is probably a good idea. So I think the, geez, the big wolves back then were uh, Laurent, Giamartini and Mick Connell. And so they put me in a lower division and I made the final and uh, I was playing Ross Burgess from New Zealand. And Ross would play his matches. Uh, he was an older guy that looked like Phil Collins. Uh, mm -hmm. and he would play his matches in moccasins. And I was like, man, this is a unique tennis attire. But he would have been at the time, I mean, yeah, I was 19 and he would have been probably late 30s, uh, mid 30s, somewhere around there. And back, I had no backhand back then. But uh, for some reason, I just got to the final. And I remember he hit everything to my backhand and I thought that was so unfair. And I was kind of offended. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was just he was just kind of running his tactics. Um, but I figured it out and, you know, eventually won. But uh, I think that was the big thing for me too was going to, the, to those kind of tournaments and, and kind of seeing, you know, the big dogs of the sport play. And that, that for me was, was pretty inspiring. And it was when, let's see, the next year in 1990 when I went to Japan, and I saw Randy Snow and Laurent Giamatini play the final. And that, that was just, for me, that was inspiring because looking at those guys and the shots and the way they manoeuvred the chair and the crowd going wild. And, and I remember uh, Randy was losing. Uh, he was getting absolutely crushed. It was, it was 6 1 5 love. And he slowly dragged it back. And all the Japanese fans are going berserk. And he got it back to five all, second set, won that. 
And then Paula Wright just collapsed in the third. And Randy had saved wow. multiple match points. And I remember looking at that match and the reaction of everyone and Randy celebrating at the end. And then I said it to myself, that's what I want to do. I want to be the number one player in the world because I wanted what Randy had, like that thrill of, of victory, you know, on such a big stage. And, and I think that for me was a big defining moment as well. Yeah, well, uh, on that then, you, you did go on to become the world's number one player and you only got half an hour together, which really seems a shame. We could probably talk all, all afternoon about your incredible achievements from that point onwards. You won all the majors, you won the Australian Open eight times, um, and I mentioned all of the various halls of the fame that you've been inducted to since. Through that time, though, is there one particular match that comes to mind? You know, if, if, if they said you get to play one game again, and enjoy that match uh, one one more time. Was there a particular match you look back at and think that was the one? Well, I, you know, it's tricky for me because the first time I won the US Open in 95, that was the day that I got to number one in the world. So I guess normally I could say that match, but I guess to be honest, I would have to say the match that meant more was the gold medal match in Sydney because there'd been so much expectation leading into it and so much build up. And of, of course I'd put pressure on myself because I wanted to win at home and I was the number one seed and I was expected to win. But to be honest, for those 11 days of the tennis, uh, I didn't really play my best, but I just kind of hung around long enough to get to the final and then playing Stevie Welsh in the final, who was a big rival for me, like all throughout my career. Um, and he was a big time competitor. And I just remember the match going through it uh, and then the crowd was building up and then there was a lot of people in that stadium. And I think then you just gotta focus, keep it together and, and you know play the big points the best you can. And then uh, after I won, I just couldn't believe it. Like, honestly, I think I had just not let my my mind go that I could win. I was just so focused uh, that I just, after I won, I remember I took my hat off. I played in these sunnies and I took my sunnies off and I just put my hands, like, and I, I was trying to find Leslie, uh, my partner in the crowd. And, of course, I'm not going to find her amongst 10,000 people. Uh, and then I was just like, I was just in shock. And I was looking for Coach Rich and, you know, where was he? Um, and it was just a culmination of the dream come true. And so if I could say out of, I don't know, the thousand matches that I played throughout my career, if, if I could have one match that I just had to win that meant the most, then it would be that one. That was it, Sydney 2000. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, and you know, in a 15-year career, like I had, I played a lot of matches and a lot of tournaments, and so it's sometimes it can be tricky to pick out just one match that was, you know, memorable or that, that I'd want to relive. And I just remember after the match, I think I felt more relief than anything else because mm. you know I'd done exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, but it just happened to be in, in the biggest uh, pressure situation. Yeah. It, it's interesting, earlier on you, you mentioned some fella playing in moccasins. Did you have any rituals or any quirks or, you know, anything a bit odd that we need to know about in terms of the way that you would prepare or even superstitions that you used when you were playing? <laughs> oh, Mick, I had a lot of odd things going on, a lot of superstitions. Um, I used to, uh, I got into the habit of, uh, I, I still do, I love this band Slayer, a heavy metal band. And uh, I remember the early years of the US Open, you could push from the hotel to the racket club of Irvine. And I used to do it alone because I put Slayer in my Walkman. And if anyone knows Slayer out there, it's like the heaviest band out there. 
and it relaxed me. And it was just a weird, I don't know, yeah. mentally it took me to a different place. And by the time I got to the courts, I felt like I was ready to, to compete. Uh, and a friend of mine, Glenn, uh, he gave me a frog, not a real frog, a toy frog. And uh, I put it in my racket bag for good luck. And the frog was called Martina Hopalova. And when I got inducted into the International Tennis Hall of Fame uh, in Newport, Rhode Island, they said, can you send us some stuff for the induction that we'll put in the museum uh, forever? And, could, you know, if you want, make it quirky. I mean, it just doesn't have to be trophies and whatever. So I sent them uh, Martina Hopple over. And so they put it under glass casing and wow. the kids would come in like into the museum and, and uh, the curator told me later that if there's one thing we know that we have to clean after all the public have left, it's that glass casing around Martina Hopalova because all the kids, all they want to do is touch her. You know, like they want to, they want to play with the, the, the toy frog. And I also sent them uh, my Slayer cassette tape that I used to put in the right. wall like all those years earlier. And so they display uh, the Slayer tape at the, at the International Tennis Hall of Fame, which is cool. It is cool. I wonder whether Glenn knew the, the impact he would have by giving you Martina Hobble over at the time, but you know, um, gone all the way to the Tennis Hall of Fame. Yeah, I don't think he did. I mean, that frog travel must have done, oh, my gosh, 500,000 miles. I mean, that because that tennis bag went to a lot of countries and a lot of cities, and, and uh, it was kind of ironic. It was also cool that Glenn, who gave me the frog, was actually at my induction in Newport, Rhode Island as well. So he kind of, he kind of got to see Martina in the, the glass casing. Very nice. Hey, um, we've got a bunch of questions coming through. I want to get to as many of them as possible, David. So Cameron asks, why do they call you Diva David telling the Angelina Jolie story? Now, <laughs> you can choose not to. It's up to you. <laughs> oh, that sounds like Cam. Um, Diva, I have no idea where I got Diva from. Apparently, we're in the Hunter Valley and uh, we had to check out of the vineyard, the rooms that we were at, and I guess I was a bit slow getting all my luggage together and uh, the cleaner knocked on the door and I said something like, oh, the cleaner's here already. And they all thought that was a diva move. And I, I, just, I just thought I was just slow, like in the morning, uh, getting ready. Yeah, right. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Diva, yeah, it's so it's so not me, you know, because I'm I'm not a diva. I'm just a laid back kind of guy that uh, I don't think I have any diva moves. But I believe you, mate. Others wouldn't, but I believe you. Now um, uh, we've got Ali sending these um, messages through, and anyone that's out there want, wants to ask a question, please. Minutes to go. Taryn McBrien, what was more memorable, winning gold in Sydney or your desert jewel trip to New Zealand? <laughs> I don't know. That that desert jewel trip uh, a couple of years back, I know I had to, uh, after we got back, I had to uh, put my liver into recovery because uh, that kind of copped a hiding on that trip. But, but no, that, that, was, that was very cool, obviously for a, a great cause. But, um, yeah, I've done, I think that's the cool thing about, uh, having the kind of career that I did that I do get to do like a lot of cool stuff and like a lot of different things uh, happen to me, you know, throughout the years that are, I guess you could say unique, uh, which is, you know, I'll always be grateful for that kind of thing. Yeah, indeed. And Todd, Todd Parker, uh, is there a link or comparison between the mental strength needed to recover from your injury and to be successful on the court? Good question. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, I think there, there's probably a def, definite uh, comparison. Uh, I think, I mean, it's interesting because I did get injured not long before the Atlanta Paralympics, uh, hurt my bicep, and so I didn't know if I'd be able to compete. And so I did fly back 
to Boulder and um, and Rich, you know, put me up at his place and I went to rehab every day. I think it was about a month or six weeks or so before the games. Um, and I think it just takes, I mean, you just have to be disciplined to do all the things needed to get over the injury, to be able to play and compete at, at hopefully your highest level. So, so there probably is a link, um, you know, a lot of correlation, but uh, even though it's two, two different things, but I think they're, they're both as important. Uh, David asks about how you're keeping fit. Now you've retired from tennis, are you still playing? You know, uh, how do you keep your felt physique in good shape? Melt. Oh, ah, uh, look. I, probably, I added that bit to be honest. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, mm. Look, I'd say uh, probably a like ping pong at the pub. I am guilty of that. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure that's connected to fitness. Uh, but Pilates, I did discover Pilates a few years back, and I think that's really changed the game for me. I think being an athlete for so long, you know, physically you things fray and things break down. And uh, so I think Pilates for me has really kind of kept me away from the surgeon's knife and realigned different things, and uh, which I think is important. But I don't know. I think when, once you retire, it's, it's interesting because you've played a sport for so long and you've been so dedicated to it that after it's over, you, I think you do, you have to find something else that kind of interests you and, I know I did uh, with Royal Rehab, I did play golf for a while, which was like one part exciting, two parts frustrating. Uh, but mm. I was, I was kind of getting into that and, th and that was kind of cool. So I think it's good to, to try different sports. Yeah, we've, we've got a, I'll take this as a comment. Can I get your autograph from Brendan Talbot there and then a go manly? Now he's, He's a rooster supporter. I've tried to have him blocked, but he seems to keep getting through out somehow. Um, uh, so, good day, Brendan. But I also um, uh, acknowledge uh, Mrs. Yvonne Talbot um, mentioned she came up on the screen earlier to say that she was um, uh, watching along there with uh, with Bob Talbot as well. Um, you know, I hark back to what you said at the beginning of the conversation about welcoming people in. Um, you know, Yvonne and, and some extraordinary other volunteers have been running that junior wheelies camp for Wheelchair Sports New South Wales for 38 years and welcoming new kids in every year. Um, that just sums up what we're all about, I think. Oh, for sure. Yeah, they are the heart of the organisation. And I think that's mm -hmm. like one of the things I was talking about with Terry and Errol earlier, that you need those people because they're such a driving force in the vision of of what the organisation wants and, and where it wants to go. And, and, and they've got a good heart. And I think that that means a lot. Uh, and I mean, you know, we, I, I don't know. Should we talk about BT being a Roosters supporter? I, you know, I'm not really, I don't know. I, I've been trying to get him over to Manly for Again. years, but it just doesn't seem to work. Yeah. We'll cut it out and I will have him blocked. Um, Pat asks us, uh, after such a long career, how did you stay motivated? You were on the tour for, for a decade and, and living overseas and, and playing, as you said, an incredible amount of tournaments. How do you keep motivated through the, the length of a career like that? Winning is addictive. And uh, I know when I won that first US Open that I just, uh, I wanted more. Like it wasn't, it wasn't enough for me that I'd won a big tournament and become number one. I wanted to do it again. And again and again, and I like I felt that way for well. The first U.S. Open was '95. Retired at the end of uh, 2005. So for 10 years, I was just it was like a constant need, like that I just couldn't get an, enough of. It was like going to the back streets in Paris, and you found this cafe, and you've just wandered in as a tourist, and the chef is going to bring you a chocolate souffle and you have no idea how good it's going to be. And then when you take that first bite, you think this is the best thing I've ever tasted. I want more. I want to come back. I want to come back to Paris every year. I want to come back to that cafe. That's what winning is. You can't get enough. And, and so I think that was the, like the big thing for me that I just, every year, it didn't, it didn't matter how much I won. I just 
I couldn't get enough and I just wanted it more and more and more. And I mean, thankfully that lasted, you know, for the next 10 years. So we're almost out of time, David. It's been, been a terrific privilege to talk to you. I really enjoyed it. And um, I know our community will have, as well. Can you just give us a sense in the last minute or so, what are you doing now? You know, how, how do you spend your days? Um, and is there any way that anyone that's interested in wheelchair tennis could follow you or get involved? Um, obviously, we've got a great community of people out there playing a range of different sports, but wherever possible, we want to encourage more people to get involved in wheelchair tennis. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Rich and I developed a website, an instructional website a few years back, uh, let's roll wheelchair tennis uh, So you can go to that. Uh, and it's interesting, I started writing a book. Oh, years ago and I kind of dabbled and other things kind of took up my time and then I think you know since everything's happened the last few months that I've really really tried to dive in to it and uh, so I've tried to remember back all those years so that kind of takes up a lot of time uh, now and so I'd say yeah be, be on the lookout for my autobiography, uh, probably, oh, I don't know, six months down the track. It take, takes a bit of time to, to get it organised, but you'll hear everything, childhood, getting into tennis, growing up in Budgie Woy, the whole career, getting stalked by a panther, crowd surfing at the big day out, I mean, the Hall of Fames. It's all going to be in there. So keep a lookout for that. We certainly will, and we'll hold you to that. So um, for everyone uh, listening to us by, by Facebook and the Wheelchair Sports New South Wales, uh, that books you out in six months. Um, so we're holding you to that, David. Um, and also we'll, uh, we'll get you on another time and talk about being stalked by a panther. Thank you for um, agreeing to be with us today. As I say, as the CEO, it's been my privilege to talk to you. I've heard a lot about you, and um, it was great to have a yarn, and I know that our community would really appreciate it as well. So um for being part of Rolling Conversations. We're very grateful. Good on you, Mick. Appreciate that. Thanks, David. Cheers, everybody.